morning. Great to see you today, church family. Glad to be here um, in this uh, position today, bringing the word. It is not often that I get to do this, and so I'm thankful to be here with you this morning. Listen, I don't know how bedtime goes for some of you in your household with little children, but in the Lou house, it can get pretty wild. We've changed the clothes, we've brushed the teeth. Got about 20 drinks of water. We've located the lost stuffed animals. We've peed in the floor in the 20 seconds it took to change diapers. We've fallen in the pee in the floor. We've cleaned up. We've changed the clothes again. And finally, we can get to read the books and pray and go to sleep for the rest of the night. Hopefully, right? Now, uh, again, I'm not sure how that runs for you all. I did take 30 of your kids to camp this last week, and I'm not sure that it was that much different, to be fair. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They were great. They were really great. But uh, we read books, we sing, we pray at the end of the night, and so uh, Banner and Elsie have picked out the books that they want to read, and uh, so I get the books and I lay down in Elsie's floor, and Elsie plops down beside me, ready to read her book. And I don't see this happen with my own eyes because I'm looking at a book. But I imagine that the bros, Banner and Charlie, they look at me laying in the floor. They look at each other. They smile. And then they look back at me and just start to pile drive me on the floor there. So just WWE right there. And I'm just trying to read this book. And uh, they are um, trying to get... On top, we're here looking over my shoulder to look at the book. The other brother gets jealous about it, so he rips his brother off, and then he gets on my back, and and it's just absolute chaos. Sometimes it ends in laughing. Sometimes it ends in crying. just depends on the day, right? And at some point, finally, probably like 45 minutes later, we get through the books, and Haley brings Charlie to his room, and I've got just the two bigs, right? And so... Uh, We sing and we pray and sometimes we do some catechisms, right? So these catechisms is the Westminster Shorter Kids Catechism I run through with my kids every now and then. And so these are like, who made you? God. What else did God make? All things. Why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. How can you glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. Why should you glorify God? Because he he made me and takes care of me. And so... Elsie's gotten pretty good at reciting these uh, catechisms, and she loves to race her brother to the answer. And I'm like, dude, she's, he's three. It's, like, it's not that big of a deal here. But one night we finish, and she looks at me and says, Daddy, did I slay that? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, baby. Yes, baby, you did. I laugh a lot about that, just the language of that comes into our children's brains. Affirmation, attention, is so important to children. They need it to know their boundaries, to test their limits, but also what to aspire to. Daddy, look at this. Daddy, watch me. Daddy, see what I made. Dad, give me your approval that this dead bug I just found is the coolest thing that you and I have ever seen, right? You see, at this age, it's, it's cute and it's endearing. A child's worldview is typically small in comparison to the rest of the world. They can really only relate their own, uh, the world to their own limited experiences and emotions, right? Because the world revolves around them. And to a degree, this is okay for a season. But Christian parenting is changing our child's view of them standing on top of of the world to recognizing that there is a God who holds them and this whole world in his hands, that he is the big God. He is great. He is good. He's in control of it all. And the things we do, our actions, our reasoning for why we do what we do, our motivation changes at some point, right? From wanting to please our parents to maybe wanting to please our uh, own desires or maybe to please the people around us that we know, maybe even don't know, to hopefully and ultimately glorifying the Lord in all of it. 
dead. Watch me. Look at me. Everyone, come and see how great I am. It's cute for a three-year-old, right? Not so much as a 34-year-old. Maturing, growing in sanctification, dying to yourself, reminding yourself of the gospel, of your need for the Lord, is a continuous part of the Christian life. The end of Matthew 5 shows that in Christ, our worldview is different. Someone slaps you, let them slap you again. That's different, that's radical. Love your neighbor and also love your enemies. Again, different, radical. Matthew 6 this morning is where we'll be, continues addressing our hearts. Three ways in which we pursue righteousness, three ways in which we pursue sanctification, in which we strive to be more like Christ. Here are three things, giving, praying, fasting. Sounds like a list. My list lovers are excited about this. Check, check, check. Got my list done. Lists are the best. Right? Raise your hand. You love lists. I appreciate a good list. Yeah, it's good. Right? But this morning, Matthew 6 is not about the list itself. Right? It's about the why and the how behind the list. It's about how and why you go about giving, praying, and fasting. Church fame, today, this morning, is a self-reflection. You see, Jesus calls us to action but presses in on the why behind those actions. What are your true intentions? So today's passage, 1 through 17, your bulletin says 15. I lumped fasting in there uh, this morning. We did uh, talk about fasting towards the beginning of the year, um, so I won't hang out there too long, but I did want to mention it as part of the spiritual disciplines or the practices that help us grow and be more like Christ. Matthew 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. The primary characters here, friends, you, other people, and God. Practice righteousness in the ways that we're about to talk about. Worship the Lord in these ways, but be mindful, be aware of your audience. Your intentions, your motivations. Verse 1 right here, opening chapter, is your big idea, your main takeaway right here up front. Do these things with your heart towards God, not towards people. Practice righteousness in a vertical posture rather than a horizontal posture. Practice these spiritual disciplines for your own sanctification and not the sanctification of others. Beware of who you're worshiping. Is it you? Or is it the Lord? Verse 2 goes on. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Reminder here this morning that Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his followers. Thus, when you give to the needy, meaning this is something that we actively do, this sets us apart, it makes us different. When you give, don't bring a trumpet and announce what you've done, or you'll be considered a hypocrite. Too easy, Pastor Joey, I don't own a trumpet. (laughs) Me either. Right? But I've got a lot of ways, I've got a lot of methods of bringing attention to myself, right? Too many, if I'm being honest. I've got a microphone right now. I've got social media. I know how to use it. could write a song. I've got a t-shirt guy. Put it on a t-shirt, right? I'm being facetious, but you get the point. Trumpet or not, we could put it all on display, our own actions, right? Hypocrite. That's a brutal word. Hypocrite is defined as a person who acts in contradiction to what they say to believe. You'll hear it two more times when we talk about praying and when we talk about fasting. So let's compare and contrast right here. Christians give to those in need. Hypocrites also give to those in need. Sounds the same. On the surface, it 
can look the same. But what's the difference? The difference is to the answer of what's going on inside your heart. Some of my first introductions to generosity was from my parents. I was about eight or nine years old, and my mom, my little sister, and I were traveling back to Malaysia to visit family. And I've not been to a southern family reunion. I know you guys have them. Um, And I imagine they're pretty familiar, probably without the t-shirts. And um, I think they're a lot louder, and they go to about 2 a.m., And so this was every night for about a week. My mom and dad are both one of eight brothers and sisters. And every night is just a huge dinner party. Mom's introducing me to people and they're pinching my cheeks and they're like, do you remember me? And I'm like, no, sorry. And so after about a week of that, uh, we took a little trip to Thailand, which is just about a flight Uh, an hour flight north. I think my grandma wanted to do some sightseeing. And so we spent the next couple of days there. And I don't remember a lot about that trip, but I have this one very vivid memory. It's crazy the things that you remember and the things that you forget. It was late one night. We were walking the streets of the big city. Lots of traffic, lots of light. They drive very differently uh, in Thailand. Uh, Motorcycles everywhere. Uh, You got to make sure you don't get hit, right? And so we're walking, and we came across this elderly woman and her granddaughter. And she's selling these puppets. She's selling these little puppets that look like emus, I think. Um, I remember it being made of blue and green yarn attached with two sticks and fishing line. So I could you know, move the feet, and then I could move the head. And my mother must have thought they were cute, or my cousin and I were interested in them. So she bought us each one, and... Of course, in like 30 seconds, it was a tangled mess. My mother and the lady were having a conversation, exchanging niceties, and and the woman had a few more of these puppets. And I watched my mother hand the lady a couple of large bills for the rest of what she had. And I don't know what these things cost, but I know that she gave the lady more than what they were worth. We left, and the elderly woman and her granddaughter got up and walked the other direction. Uh, these little puppets were, were neat, but to be honest, they weren't that cool, right? My cousin and I didn't need five more of these little emu puppets. And so as an eight or nine-year-old, I'm looking at my mother and I asked her, I said, why, why did you do that? And so she explained to me that, that this woman was going to stay there for the rest of the evening until she had sold all of her stuff, right? And she wanted to help this lady go home, bring her granddaughter home. So she bought the rest of her stock. Jesus calls us to take care of people, meet the needs of others. We give of our time, money, and resources. We help people in need with what the Lord has given us, with what he has entrusted us to steward over. It's all his already. We just use it for his glory. And so when you help people, is it because you are great or because God is great? I can't answer that for my mother. I can't answer that for you. But know that our intentions matter. That giving in a horizontal posture points others to ourselves. Giving in a vertical posture points others to the Lord. Let others call out what the Lord is doing through you. We go on in verse 5. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. There it is again. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. We will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. He goes on to pray like this. Almost a year ago, last August, we had a kids' ministry training night for our adult leaders for the upcoming year. We'll have another one in the coming months. Uh, We ate, we laughed, we popped some balloons in this room as a game, and I don't think I would do that again. It was was really, really loud. Um, 
But uh, we gave some awards and, and spent some time just casting vision and aligning our goals as a kids' ministry. And one of the things I really wanted to do on the elementary side of ministry this past year was to model prayer and provide more opportunities for our kids to pray out loud. I wanted our leaders to show that prayer is a gift that the Lord has given us, that we have access to the Father through Jesus, and we can communicate with Him anytime we want or need. And so in various parts of our programming on Wednesdays, Or Sundays, I'll pray, or an adult leader will pray, and then kids have an opportunity to pray in large group or small group or before we have our snack. And let me tell you, friends, that children praying is one of the purest things. On a typical Wednesday night, we dismiss from in here, the sanctuary, and I say, friends, thanks so much for coming tonight. Before we rock and roll out of here, I need somebody to pray us out. And all these little hands just shoot up and... Sometimes those little hands go right back down because they recognize what I just asked them to do. (laughs) And so um, I'll call on someone and they get up to the mic and uh, they get up there and they take a deep breath and they just pause and they whisper to me, I don't know what to say. I was like, that's all right. So I try to coach them through it. I said, um, I say, hey, just tell God what you're thankful for. Tell him of his character. Thank him for his goodness. Right. Um. Talk about uh, what you learned in your Bible study. Thank him for X, Y, Z. Just tell the Lord what's on your heart, what's on your mind. So they take another deep breath. And they say, God, thank you for the good snacks tonight. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Our snacks are great. Our snack team is great. And I'm totally good with that, right? We're learning, we're growing, we're continuing to model as leaders and parents, not just praying out loud with people, but what prayer is in your time alone with the Lord, trying to communicate that the Lord wants to know what's going on in your heart and minds, even when he already knows, because he loves you. We can pray whenever, not just specific times. Jesus is not condoning long public prayers, but reminding us to be mindful of the words behind what we're praying about why we're praying. Verse 7, do not heap up empty phrases. The CSB says don't babble. I don't too often in my circles of people witness people praying in public for their own recognition or to be thought highly of. Uh, But let me just press in a little bit more here. What about praying just to get it done, that check box? Right? Putting our prayer life on autopilot, just saying things we remember without the heart behind it. Worship pastors talk about this often how a time of prayer in your liturgy or your order of worship is not a time of transition. It's not a vehicle to get you from one place to the next. Well, sure it is. When I end my message here in just a little bit, you're going to bow your heads and close your eyes. And when you open them, Rebecca and Blake will be up here ready to sing the next song. Magic, right? So do we use prayer as a transition? Yeah, sure. But it's not the why behind it. See, we currently pray in three very specific spots in our time together. Before we sing, before uh, before the teaching of the word, and before we respond. And very often we pray for specific things during these times. Before we sing. We pray that words that we're singing would point us to God, our need for Jesus, that we would find rest and encouragement in him today in our time together, right? I know that you just fought with your teenager on the way here. I know that your children were being the children of wrath that they are. I know that work was really difficult this week. And so we're praying to help remind you that in the middle of all that chaos, take a moment to recognize that the God we worship is good. Being reminded together of God's attributes, of his faithfulness, and the songs we sing are going to reflect that and help encourage you to rest in him. We pray before we open up his word, we pray that his word is all sufficient, that he is all sufficient, that it's not about the man preaching the word, but about God's word itself, and that it would change our hearts, reveal sin in our lives, call us to sanctification, and how to live like Christ in this broken and fallen world. And before we respond, we pray that his word did stir up 
affections in our heart, called us to action that we need to respond to. We pray for boldness to act upon that, to forgive, seek reconciliation, and leave this place rejoicing in what God has done. Empty phrases, babbling. As I work through these words, these verses, those words continue to live in my brain. I found myself in, in, in my own self-reflection, some conviction, right? Uh, there have definitely been times that I've prayed just to get us to the next thing. It works. I check that box on to the next, right? Sometimes my brain is two steps ahead of what I'm actually doing. I'm disconnected, and it's a glaring heart check for me to be fully present. Maybe you struggle with knowing what to say or how to say it. Remember, the Lord is concerned with our hearts. The Lord's prayer is a great model for us to follow. Jesus gives us this great example, but not one to repeat without understanding what we are praying. The Lord's prayer says this, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. What are we doing? Recognizing His sovereignty uh, we're, sorry, we're God, that we're recognizing that God is holy, that he's set apart, right? We begin acknowledging that the character of God, who he is, his attributes. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Recognize his sovereignty, that he's in control of all things. Give us this day our daily bread. Acknowledge our need for Christ daily, not just a one-time decision, but continually recognizing our need for a savior and forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors to kill sin repent we've been forgiven help us to forgive and in verse 14 the following verse adds another emphasis to forgive to seek reconciliation with others forgive as Christ has forgiven us not completely conclusive right so much more we could unpack from this, but are we praying in a horizontal posture, pleasing people, making them think or feel a certain way about us, or in a vertical posture, recognizing that prayer is a gift? Like giving, prayer is an act of worship. You spend time in secret praying for the things that burden you. Cry out to the Lord with your needs. Praise Him for the things He has done secret in your own time with the Lord, when it's just you and Him. Jesus models this all throughout Scripture for us, for us to do the same. Lastly, fasting, verse 16, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. There it is again. For they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Church family, what's the reward? Well, from a horizontal posture, you win from the moment you got the compliment you were looking for. The moment you felt that feeling you were chasing. I'm not saying that's you. I don't know your why. That's between you and the Lord. But if the shoe fits, sometimes it fits me. But from a vertical posture, our reward is being made more like Christ's sanctification. Pastor Joey, why would I want that? Compliments are way more fun. Fair, maybe. But true joy comes from knowing Christ, right? Sanctification, pursuing righteousness, allows us to know Jesus deeper and finding true joy in him. So we give, we pray, we fast, we practice this thing, these things for our own sanctification and not others. This morning we're about to take communion. Take some time to pause and reflect. Again, I ask you, self-evaluation here. Self-reflection. Where are you at this morning? Where's your heart? I can't answer that for you, but I'm telling you that every time I step on this stage here, that I can make it about myself. It's very, very tempting, probably pretty easy to do. 
right? That the things I do can bring attention and glory to myself, and that would be um, not the move, right? Who deserves the glory? God deserves the glory. I can't steal his glory. Uh, in kids' ministry, they have, a, uh, they have a whole chant for my name, right? Um, and I, I'm, I wonder sometimes, I'm like, man, visitors, they probably just think that I am this egomaniac, right? They're just chanting my name. And, man, I think that my heart could be that way, for sure, right? And we all have to be on guard, be aware of those things. Where do we want our hearts to be? What are we striving for? How are we becoming more like Christ? A question I ask myself on the reg, and some days sin is present in my life, and I really have to dig in and trust in the Lord and give those things to the Lord. So again, I ask, where are you this morning? Maybe your worldview isn't quite as small as my three-year-old, but has it grown? Have we moved on from look what I can do to look what God can do? It's easy to stay comfortable. Even though we get older, we age. Spiritual maturity is not a guarantee. These spiritual disciplines are muscles that need to be stretched, need to be worked. So again, I ask, where are we this morning? Do we live in a horizontal posture or more of a vertical posture? Maybe it wasn't on purpose, right? Maybe you've got some blind spots you're not aware of. I certainly do. But I trust the Lord would reveal those things to me through his word, through the work of his people, those that know me and trust me. I trust that they would say that in a loving way. That we would have healthy conversations about our blind spots.